When the Cleveland Cavaliers, in a stunning move making a blockbuster trade to acquire Donovan Mitchell in the summer of 2022, trading three first round picks, two of which being unprotected, two pick swaps, and Colin Sexton, Ochai Obaji, a player the Cavs had just selected with the 14th pick in the 2022 draft, by the way, and Lowry Markinen, the young, talented big man who, of course, would later on to become an all star for the Utah Jazz. When everyone thought Donovan Mitchell would be on his way to a big market team, namely the New York Knicks, the Cavs came swooping in to steal away the three-time all-star 25-year-old to capitalize on the Jazz fire sale of going down a path of rebuilding. The Cavs, a team who had just come off their first winning season since LeBron James left but missed the playoffs by getting eliminated from the play-in, they had signaled to the league they're looking to compete and getting back to being at the top of the Eastern Conference once again. An all-in move to bring in that superstar to bring the land back to relevance. And while the Cavs would go on to have one of the best regular seasons since LeBron, winning 51 games and securing home court advantage in the first round of the playoffs, the success they saw in the regular season didn't really carry over into the postseason, and the Cavs would go on to lose in five games to the Knicks ending their great season abruptly. And at the time, people thought, hey, it happens. This was the first season of the new look roster together with Donovan Mitchell. They have to go through some growing pains, learn from their mistakes, and come back ready to be even better next season. After all, no one thought the Cavs were going to be winning a title in that first year after making that all-in trade for Donovan Mitchell. But changes were going to need to be made. It was clear their front court strength and physicality wasn't able to be matched to that of the Knicks, and their slow-paced offense, while efficient, wasn't going to be sustainable over time. But going into the offseason in 2023, the Cavs' only big move was adding the sharpshooter Max Struess in a sign-and-trade deal with the Miami Heat, a good pickup for the Cavs who needed more outside shooting on their roster, but most would agree wasn't going to move the needle much for them in elevating this team from the prior season into title contention. And sure enough, that ended up being the case, as the Cavs not only didn't improve or build upon their prior season's success, they actually regressed by winning three less games, dropping from the best defensive team in the league to sixth, and their offensive rating would go from top 10 in the NBA to 18th. A team that was second in net rating in the 22-23 season would fall to 13th in the following year. The Cavs suffered injuries throughout the season, with their most prominent players being in and out of the lineup. Donovan Mitchell would miss 27 games, Darius Garland would miss 25, Evan Mobley missed 32. So naturally, you're not going to see the team perform as well when the guys aren't healthy, but it was pretty clear that while this Cavs team was good, one of the better teams in the Eastern Conference, but even when healthy, they're not on that level yet of being true title contenders. And when they disappointed yet again in the playoffs, some were saying, well, it's probably time to break up Garland and Mitchell. Some even speculating that Donovan Mitchell likely wouldn't re-sign with the Cavs and opt to become a free agent in 2025, potentially losing the player they mortgaged most of their future on for nothing. But while the Cavs season ended in disappointment and more injuries, it left a lot of people thinking, what's going to be the future of this team and what are the changes that would take place this offseason to get them to the next level? But despite guys like Darius Garland, Donovan Mitchell, and Jared Allen being in trade rumors and speculation, the Cavs have since doubled down on this core and not only keeping all their guys, but extending most of them to long-term deals. And while some might say, eh, not a bad move, after all, their core players are still relatively young, they're still a good team, maybe not a championship-level team, but a solid team, why not keep running it back with this group? working on their holes and weaknesses and continue to get better to eventually make a title run. But the question I often ask myself is, should the Cavs really be going all in on this core? Or has this group effectively hit their ceiling and it'll be too late by the time they realize it? Well, let's talk about it further in this video. As always, if you're new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to help the channel grow and in return I'll be providing more NBA content like this. Now, I look back on that first round matchup between the Orlando Magic and the Cavs this past playoffs and there was something very telling to me in that series because even though the Cavs would go on to win the series in seven games, securing a playoff series win, something they weren't able to achieve last season, they still had to take a team that was younger, had no playoff experience, and their lack of experience showed greatly in that series, it still took them seven games to take them out. The Cavs, given where they are in the push to being competitive and trying to win now, should have no problem in beating out one of the youngest teams in the NBA and keeping them on their toes all the way to the end of Game 7. And the reason I say that it's telling is because a team like the Orlando Magic, who only won one less game than the Cavs did, a team younger with their best players having not even entered their primes yet, a team like that is already on their way to being projected to be better than the Cavs next season. 
But even the magic aside, you also have the Pacers who will get better now with a full year of Pascal Siakam on their roster, Halliburton continuing to get better, another young team with star-level talent that will be a threat to the Cavs and their positioning in the Eastern Conference. And then, of course, what about the Sixers who just added Paul George, extended their up-and-coming star in Maxi, and hope to have Joel Embiid back and healthy? That right there is three teams alone who finished below the Cavs this past season that most would project to be better than where they finished last year. And of course, this doesn't even include the teams at the top in the Celtics, Knicks, and the Milwaukee Bucks. And yes, a lot of things can happen over the course of an NBA season. Injuries could derail one team to the benefit of another. A team that had promise going into the season could surprisingly regress or fall below expectations. But regardless, looking at the landscape across the Eastern Conference, I don't see how anyone could say that the Cavs are one of the favorites to make it out of the East as currently constructed. And so in my view, change was in order for that franchise. Big trades, moves on the margins to keep up with the moves their opponents were making to be more competitive. But instead, the Cavs' transactions this season consisted of offering max contract extensions to both Donovan Mitchell and Evan Mobley. Evan Mobley getting a five-year rookie max deal at $224 million. Donovan Mitchell at three years, $150 million. And then more recently, the Cavs renegotiating and extending Jared Allen for an additional three years, $91 million, making his new guaranteed amount over the next five seasons, $131 million. The message was clear. The Cavs are riding with this core for the long term. With now Mitchell, Garland, Mobley, and Allen all under contract through 2028, and Mobley and Jared Allen even under contract for one more season after that in 2029. Going into this upcoming season, the Cavs have around $161 million guaranteed on their books, enough to put them over the salary cap at about $9 million below the luxury tax threshold. Not terrible considering you have a lot of teams who were worse than the Cavs last season that are already paying the luxury tax, like the Lakers, Warriors, Suns, and the Clippers. And so you think, well, okay, the Cavs will have some flexibility by way of their use of the mid-level exception to improve their roster and making moves on the margins to give them some more depth. But going into the following season, the 25-26 season, this is where things get very tricky for the Cavs and how they have positioned themselves financially. Already, two seasons from now, the Cavs have $181 million guaranteed on their books, a figure that already makes them a first apron luxury tax team, a season where they will pay Garland, Mitchell, and Mobley alone $124.4 million combined. You add Jarrett Allen and Max Struess to that, and you have a combined salary of $160.4 million between five players. This, of course, doesn't even factor in Karis LeVert, who is going to be on an expiring deal this upcoming season, a player that Cavs will likely have to let walk for nothing because they simply won't be able to pay him. And while the Cavs starting five is great, I don't think anyone would argue against that. One of their biggest problems, though, from last season was their lack of depth off the bench, which became abundantly clear when they hit the injury bug. And for a team that has nearly all their cap space locked up between five players for the next three seasons, it severely limits them to make moves on the margins, those smaller moves that round out your roster and provide you more depth and versatility when going into the playoffs. When you're a team like the Celtics, yes, it makes sense to lock up all of your core guys for the foreseeable future. But for a team that, again, is still very good, no one is saying they're trash, but a team that still has a lot of flaws, a team that remain limited in their ability to get as many possessions and shot attempts as their opponent, a team that struggled on the offensive glass despite having two of the more prominent bigs in the league, one they just gave a max contract to, a team that could not keep up with the young, fast pace and space teams that the league thrives on, and more importantly, a team on most nights didn't really seem to want it more than their opponent. A team that was often disengaged, not energized, frustrated on the court. That's a team that you go all in with to fill up your cap sheet for the foreseeable future. This is the team you deem to be worthy of title contention to bring Cleveland back to the promised land. I don't know. Maybe I'm being too harsh. Maybe I'm being too critical, but I just don't see it. I see this core being a second round exit team, conference finals team at best. Just my opinion, though. I would love to hear what you guys think. Let me know in the comments. As always, be sure to subscribe and I'll see you in the next one.